Thank you all for joining us today. And uh, I, I, I'm, it's my great honor and pleasure to be moderating this panel and to, to take us on a, a, a little bit of a trip, um, uh, albeit a virtual trip, uh, an intellectual trip uh, to Europe, um, something that maybe uh, many of us here in Japan have, have been unable to do uh, recently. Um, so we have uh, four uh, distinguished panelists with us um, uh, who uh, uh, span from uh, London uh, to Moscow uh, to here in Tokyo. Um, and, and with a wealth of expertise, uh, uh, both uh, in their home countries, but also uh, in, in how their, their uh, home countries relate to Japan and to the Indo-Pacific. Um, so that's really what I'm hoping we will, will, will get into today. Um, it's, it's stunning to, to see, especially in, in recent years, um, uh, the turn uh, in, in European um, thinking and, and in European activity in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, we have the UK declaring a global Brexit, a global Britain strategy, excuse me, after Brexit um, and, and sending uh, aircraft carriers uh, to visit uh, uh, here in, in Japan and, 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 and through the region. Uh, we have uh, uh, the EU talking about an Indo-Pacific strategy uh, really for the first time uh, and, and, and growing uh, European interest in and, and, and awareness of uh, uh, geopolitics in, in, in the Indo-Pacific and, and, and specifically uh, the relationship with China. Uh, we have Russia uh, having declared a, a pivot of its own to the east uh, and, and what seems to be, at least on the surface, uh, 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 improving uh, um, ties between Moscow and, and, and Beijing. Um, verging on what some uh, say may even even look like a, 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 an, an alliance. Um, and and, and uh, we have Japan as well, of course, uh, uh, welcoming uh, and, and I would say leading uh, uh, in terms of, of um, bringing uh, European activity to, to the Indo-Pacific. And, and, and uh, I'd like to, to ask um, each of you just just to start off, and we'll, we'll start from London and, and maybe move, um, move eastward. Um, uh, uh, we'll, we'll move uh, with, with Professor Nikkei um, uh, through, through Europe. Um, uh, we'll imagine that you're sitting somewhere in Paris, even though you're, uh, you're here with us today. Um, I'd like to ask each of you to, to, to sort of explain, as, as you see it, the drivers uh, of this, this increased activity, this increased interest in, in, uh, in Asia and, and in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, Joanna, why don't you kick us off? Thank you very much, Noah. And uh, just before I begin, I should say that my views expressed today don't represent those of Bailey Gifford Japan Trust. Um, so purely personal um, s standing here. So first of all, I thought I would explain that the UK released in March this year the a new integrated review of security, defence, development and foreign policy. Um, this strategy has been called Global Britain in a Competitive Age, and it sets out a vision of the UK as an international actor operating its levers of power and influence in a much more coordinated way, uh, upholding international rules and norms through close alliances as we see it with the US, the EU, and now new deeper ties with the democracies of the Asia-Pacific region. Um, the, the UK's tilt towards the Indo-Pacific is based on three reasons. Um, first of all, economic, um, because it is the world's growth engine. Secondly, security, to preserve freedom of navigation in a region of intensifying geopolitical competition and potential flashpoints. And thirdly, um, because of reasons of values, to promote open societies and to uphold international rules and norms. Um, the UK would like to deepen engagement in the Indo-Pacific. And I should say that Japan is considered one of the UK's closest strategic partners in the region. Um, this new Indo-Pacific tilt reflects the reality that dealing with China is at the top of the UK's foreign policy consideration. Um, the UK's largely commercial approach of the past from the Cameron Osborne years in the mid 2010s has now turned to a more clear eyed geostrategic attitude. Um, the UK recognizes China poses the biggest 
state-based threat to the UK's economic security and a systemic challenge to British security, prosperity and values. But at the same time, the UK would like to engage China at multiple levels, of course, including trade and investment with additional safeguards and seeking cooperation on climate change, for example. Um, so in effect, the UK's approach to China is, as quoted in the Global Britain Strategic Review, to compete where necessary, cooperate where possible, and counteract when necessary. So um, just briefly, what does this Indo-Pacific tilt look like? As Noah mentioned, um, during this past year, the Royal Navy has led a five-month deployment of aircraft carrier strike group, and which visited Japan and other parts of the region. This is all about showcasing global Britain for regional and, but also very much also for British audiences. Um, and I understand that two patrol vessels remain deployed in the Western Pacific for several years. And um, another aspect of the Indo-Pacific tilt will, I'm sure all of you have read about AUKUS, the um, military technology sharing agreement signed in September between the UK, US and Australia, which is also an agreement to share cyber, AI and quantum computing advances, which sort of put some meat on the bones of the integrated review and ties the UK strategically to the region much more closely. Joanna, um, let, me, let me step in for a second and, and, and uh, uh, because I think this is a great um, uh, uh, transition perhaps to the, to the EU um, section of the panel, um, uh, 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 um, AUKUS in particular. Um, uh, I, I'd like to ask you, Professor Nikkei, uh, how, how the EU uh, uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, how the EU vision of, of, of its role in, in the Indo-Pacific um, aligns or, or doesn't align um, with, with this new global Britain um, and, and, and uh, whether you see alignment or, or, or tension in terms of, of the interest in the region. Is it okay? Yeah. Uh, interestingly, yes, there is a lot of overlapping because basically we are facing the same challenges. So uh, even though uh, now after Brexit, uh, Brexit UK is uh, leading, living its own life away from the EU, uh, still we, are, we share a lot of common interest. And this is an important point to remind. Uh, I will just give the framework of this uh, European Indo-Pacific strategy that arrived following the French one. Uh, and then Germany, the Netherlands, with some differences. One very important point is that the EU is a major actor in terms of economics and technology transfer in the Asia-Pacific, first investor, first uh, trade partner to China. So the EU has a role to play uh, to balance also the inf growing influence of China. It's not only dependency on China, it's uh, interdependency on China is as much dependent on the EU market, for instance, on technology. So it gives us, us some capacity to act. Uh, in the EU, uh, the EU uh, Indo-Pacific uh, strategy also acknowledges that security in uh, Asia-Pacific or Indo-Pacific is as a direct relation with EU stability and uh, uh, economic uh, development in all fields. So this is the, where the evolution is very important. Uh, Indo-Pacific matters for the EU in terms of security and stability. Uh, and when you look at the main point of the Indo-Pacific Pacific, Indo -Pacific strategy for the EU, uh, at least three, digital governance, connectivity, security and defense directly relate to the economic security issues on what is the subject of this panel, uh, uh, innovative resilience. Uh, of course, uh, economic uh, security, uh, in order to achieve economic security, we need also a much more robust, and it was uh, tackled this morning in another session, supply chain and better cooperation also with the US, Japan, Australia, but also, of course, the UK. We share, once again, we share the same objectives there. Uh, 
And one example of uh, the diversification, which is a very important point of the EU uh, Indo-Pacific strategy, is, for instance, the Japan-EU strategic partnership agreement that was uh, decided in 2018 and then uh, uh, get, went into um, uh, reality in 2019. This is an example of partnership as I said, to diversify beyond China, because before China used to be the main partner, now we are trying to build much more closer political and economic cooperation with countries like Japan, but also India or some ASEAN countries based, as was mentioned, on shared values. Um, and it was exactly, uh, there is an example, which is a visit of uh, Thierry Breton from the EU to Japan recently and South Korea to demonstrate this interest in cooperation. Just to conclude, I would la like to add, this is something that has been de debated a lot, all these uh, overlapping interests and uh, necessity to build a more robust, robust uh, supply chain cannot equate with absolutely no autonomy for the EU uh, to define its own interest and defend also its own high technology industries in critical sectors. It, uh, one cannot deny that there is also an element of competition among allies, also, but also among uh, private sectors companies, including with the US, and that must be taken into account in order to be able a better dialogue and better success uh, in, in, in achieving that robust supply chain that is a necessity for all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let, let me turn now to, to Sasha in, in, in Moscow. Um, what, what should we make, uh, I think for, for those of us uh, sitting here in Japan, there, there is a, a, a tendency to see uh, Russia and China as, as sort of a single block, as, as, as in, in alignment. Um, what, what should we make of the relationship between Russia and China now, and, 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 and what's behind sort of Russia's uh, uh, pivot to the East, as it were? Thanks, Noah, and uh, great to be with you. Uh, I think that Russia is part of the Indo-Pacific by the visual geography. Two-thirds of the country are located. Uh, in the Indo-Pacific or Asia-Pacific, as we prefer to call it in Moscow. Uh, it's a resource-rich area that's underdeveloped and requires access to markets, access to technology, and access to investment. And uh, most likely sources of this development uh, are within the region. Moscow, for historical reasons, have been neglecting this part of the country and putting all of the eggs in the basket Europe. But now uh, the Kremlin has finally woken up to the big developments and uh, shifting of economic gravity to Asia and is trying to capitalize, uh, to capitalize on that. So this is an overarching trend uh, that would happen with or without annexation of Crimea, Western sanctions and the rupture between Russia and the West. But on top of that, of course, come political considerations when Russia annexed Crimea, was put uh, under multiple and uh, enlarging sanctions regime. Uh, it had to look for partners elsewhere. And uh, unfortunately, there were not too many doors to knock on in Asia because many of the most mature and technologically advanced countries are U.S. allies and uh, are G7 uh, partners like Japan uh, and have to follow the leads of the a senior partner in the coalition and had also their own reasons because Russia's annexation of Crimea has violated some values and norms that they deem important. Uh, so there was certain note of caution on part of Japanese, Korean and other companies of uh, doing business with Russia. So the only big door to knock was China. And I think that even zooming out and trying to look at the big picture, you have this massive border where Russia has settled its territorial dispute with China that provides some sense of security and need to engage in a relationship that Russia and China never turns turn against each other because it's just too risky and too expensive. Uh, then there is this unexplored economic opportunity. Russia is a giant pot of hydrocarbons, metals, fertilizers, uh, ag products, you name it. Uh, and it needs market and technology and money to develop those resources. And China is exactly the opposite. 
So it's a match made in heaven, just like Russia and the European Union. And uh, finally, neither Russia nor China is a democracy in Western sense, although in both of our constitutions, we are still a democracy in China is a uh, people's democracy with Chinese characteristics. Uh, but uh, I don't think that Xi Jinping really bothers whether Alexei Navalny walks as a free man or whether uh, FSB tried to poison him. Neither is Vladimir Putin really bothered whether uh, these are just nice vacation educational centers in Xinjiang or these are real concentration camps. Uh, so this agenda doesn't exist between Russia and China, and that smoothens the relationship a lot. Uh, so we see that uh, since 2014, Russia has really increased its outreach to Asia Pacific, but particular to China. China's share as Russia's trading partner has grown twofold over the course of uh, the last eight years. So if in 2013, sh share of China as Russia's trading partner was just 10 percent, this year is likely to land at 20 plus percent, particularly driven by the energy crunch in China. And that we see deepening of security ties as well, very well on display recently offshore uh, in Japan with the Russian and Chinese fleet conducting joint exercises. And that relationship continues to, uh, to deepen. My final point is that uh, the name of religion uh, in Russia is strategic autonomy. So if we have a state religion in geopolitics, that's strategic autonomy. Russia really doesn't want to be dictated upon by any major power, not the West, but also not China. And uh, since China is not crossing Russian uh, red lines in terms of domestic politics, Russia is more happy to accept the link to China and to be a more junior partner in this relationship. But Russia is also very much aware of the growing asymmetry. And I don't think anybody in the Russian leadership is naive to believe that China will always treat Russia with respect and nicely. Once China builds its leverage, it can exploit it to kind of get concessions uh, from the Russian side. And so Russia is also trying to diversify its ties. But unfortunately, there are not that many options. Uh, the relationship with the West will remain very hostile. And uh, there is an attempt to pragmatically manage that on part of Tim Biden. My former boss, who is now CIA director, Bill Burns, is now in town just to establish these pragmatic channels of communication with the Russian security team. But it's not about improvement. It's about managing of very acute security risks. Same with Japan, probably, as Team Abe has invested many resources in building this relationship and to no avail, I would say. So not that much will happen, and uh, ties with China are very likely to continue strengthening absolutely major shifts. Thank you for Thanks. that, Sasha. Um, can, we, can, we, can we hear from you, Tsuroko Sensei? How, how does Japan view, uh, view these, these, these shifts? I mean, the, the, the growing interest on the one hand uh, from, from European partners uh, and the growing alignment uh, on the other hand between uh, uh, Russia and China. Okay, uh, thank you very much, and thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, yes, the, the Tokyo very much welcomes growing European engagement in the Indo-Pacific region. So they demonstrated by the deployment of aircraft carrier or the, the French uh, amphibious assault ship. So they, we welcome, so whatever the format it takes. The, but at the same time, we, we, we don't have any illusion about the, the, particularly when it comes to security and defense, we don't have any illusion what Europeans could bring to the table in this region. So the Europe will not certainly change the balance of power in the region, particularly vis-a-vis -vis China. So, but still, the more European engagement, increasingly European engagement will help generate shared perceptions on what is taking place in the region between Japanese and Euro other Asians and, and Europeans. And because the, this is really important because the, given the fact that uh, the the challenges of China, challenges stemming from the rise of China and the implications of it, is really multifaceted. So the, we are not really fighting a war, but uh, we have economic security dimensions and technology and other things. So that is why the getting Europeans on board and getting other like-minded countries on board is really important. And this is also another way to, to, to challenge the Chinese sort of a discourse 
that is very much uh, is, uh, the, something the Global Times and other uh, and the Chinese uh, organizations are putting forward, which is that uh, this is all about Sino-American competition. And Americans are not prepared to accept the rise of China. And uh, Americans are trying to draw other countries into Sino-American competition. But that's not quite true. Because Europeans have their own stakes, and Europeans have their own interests and reasons to, to, to be engaged in this region. So not, not Europeans are here not to please Americans. Of course, that sort of element might be there to some extent, but uh, largely, fundamentally, the Europeans are here because they have their own interests. And that is good for Japan as well. Because uh, we share a lot of things with uh, like-minded countries in Europe, of course, including the European Union per se, and uh, so, so, the, so getting uh, other uh, uh, countries on board that, that that is quite good. And in that sense, the the EU strategy is quite quite interesting from Tokyo uh, Tokyo's perspective because it is about going beyond China, so emphasizing cooperation with like-minded countries and going beyond economy because the, the EU is very much an economic superpower, but now going beyond that is something that uh, we very much welcome. The China-Russia thing, uh, the, the Russia, very sorry for, for Sasha, that it's a bit complicating factor for, for Japan, and particularly they just uh, demonstrated that uh, joint sort of a, the, the cruising of a, uh, the naval uh, and the ships surrounding Japan with the China-Russia thing. So, so that we are still wondering how we could and what we could do uh, with, with, with Russia in, in terms of thinking about the uh, Indo-Pacific region. Thank you. Can I come back, uh, uh, because we've all, uh, uh, for all of you in, in different ways have mentioned, um, mentioned the, the, the difference in interests. I mean, autonomy on the part of the EU, autonomy on the part of Russia, um, uh, uh, autonomy in the form of Brexit um, on the part of the UK. Um, uh, these, these strategies, these shifts um, are not just about uh, uh, following uh, following an American lead or following a Chinese lead, they, as you say, they're 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 uh, born of of uh, the EU's own interests, the UK's own interests, Russia's own interests, and and I'd I'd like to ask you, Professor Nikkei, to, to to expand a little bit more on on in, especially in terms of of economy and and technology, um, where uh, uh, where EU thinking is at these days uh, 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 regarding regarding the economic relationship with China, regarding technological. Uh, uh, t technological exchange with China. I mean, we hear a lot of talk about decoupling in, in America. Uh, um, it's still unclear what exactly the Biden administration's uh, trade policy will be, but it looks a whole lot like a continuation of the Trump administration's. How does, how does the EU feel about this? Decoupling uh, is a difficult issue, not only for the EU, but uh, for everyone. I mean, uh, the intricacies of uh, relationship between China uh, that all the world let become uh, uh, the main producer of many goods in the world uh, makes it extremely difficult to just declare decoupling with China. I think uh, the EU's position is to focus on some very strategic domain uh, where we need to be m much more aware of what China wants and the threat it might pose in the future for uh, the independence of uh, Europe and its allies uh, in some very critical sector. And this is why I mentioned in, in, in that uh, Indo-Pacific strategy that sectors like uh, cyber com connectivity and so on is uh, really at the heart of what we must be careful about. Um, this morning, we, there was a mention of rare health and uh, how uh, China used it a few years ago against Japan, uh, just to illustrate the fact that actually China is not the place in the world where you find the, uh, the most of the rare earth reserves. It's only the place where it was much cheaper to exploit it without any respect for environmental. Uh, and this is how China could become a leader in some sectors. Uh, but I think that European countries and EU as a whole is much more aware of the necessity to try to rebuild some capacities in sub -se some sectors with the support of other countries like Japan, for instance. Mm 
can I ask you, Sasha, also to, to, to talk a bit more about um, the, the relationship in, in technology between uh, uh, Russia and China? I mean, you mentioned uh, growing a, a concern as well about um, over-dependence or about asymmetry in the relationship. And, and, and in, in, I know you've written about this quite a lot, but in terms of, of, of the technological um, uh, decoupling that we're seeing or the technological sort of spheres that we're seeing emerge. Um, to, to what extent is, is Russia uh, uh, ending up uh, in, in uh, uh, a Chinese uh, technological uh, 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 sphere of influence, as it were? Uh, pretty much so, although I think that decoupling will have a much uh, deeper rippling effects for Chinese ability to be this uh, center of its own technological universe. And uh, I'm sure that import substitution and billions uh, that Chinese pour into upgrading their talents and their production base will yield results. But the pace of their advancement becoming less reliant on U.S. technology is just very questionable. Um, I think that a broader uh, driver is Russia's demand for new technology overall. And even before the sanctions, Russia has discovered that, hey, China has some commercial technology that's on par with the Western, and it's actually cheaper and it's pretty reliable. So this technological import started before 2014. And then, of course, uh, introduction of sectorial sanctions made Russians very nervous and alerted and they rushed to China to seek alternatives to Western tech, uh, because the sanctions work the way that it's not that everything what is prohibited is just prohibited. But there is this cloud of ambiguity that surrounds many sectors, and particularly since Katza and since the Capitol Hill, because of distrust in the executive power led by Trump, uh, took many of the sanction decisions in its own hands. It created this sense of unpredictability that uh, 5G, for example, is not sanctioned. So Nokia, Ericsson, Samsung can work with the Russian companies. But for how long will it not be included in the next sanctions list is challenging and questionable. So Russians rushed to China to seek technological help. Uh, and I think that a parallel trend is now happening with decoupling that uh, the Chinese colleagues understand very well that a lot of their technological partnerships in the West, particularly access to foreign educated talent, will be limited going forward. So they will not be uh, able to set up university consortiums with the uh, participation of Huawei and other players. And in Russia, although the tech capabilities are limited, there are still pockets of knowledge and talent in particular in algorithmics, IT, mathematics, that are either superior to what Chinese have or just very differently trained and added to this mix of creativity. So we see that Huawei, over the course of the last three years, has tripled its research staff in Russia and is very actively hiring engineers because they understand that it's probably the only reliable source of uh, top-notch global quality brain power that is accessible to them going forward because of decoupling. Final point, I think that Russia sees a lot of short-term value in that partnership, but there are also a lot of risks attached to that, particularly if you become overly reliant on Chinese tech, you might end up in Chinese pocket. And if your 5G is built by Huawei, that means your 6G, your 7G will also be built by Huawei. Russia is trying to diversify, but again, the sanctions policy and the unpredictability and lack of domestic production base, particularly in terms of hardware, uh, makes this balancing act very challenging for the Kremlin. Joanna, can I come back to you and, and to the to the first piece of your 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 initial statement? I mean, the the economic component of uh, the the global Britain uh, approach to Asia. I mean, we've seen, uh, of course, a bilateral trade deal with between the UK and Japan. Um, we now see the UK seeking to join the CPTPP. Um, how, how are British companies, how is, how is the British uh, uh, government sort of seeing, uh, uh, seeing the playing field in, in the Indo-Pacific in, uh, in terms of its economic interests? Um, I would say that Britain is very, very keen to join as many multilateral trade agreements as possible. Um, Boris Johnson's Global Britain strategy is very much partly aimed at a UK audience, and he 
initially had thought he would get a US trade deal. That is looking less likely, certainly, at the moment. He's got the Japan one. He's hoping to set up, as you say, one with India. Um, but in the meantime, he would very much like to sort of be able to proclaim new alliances, new networks to justify his Brexit strategy and Britain standing on its own two feet. So we would like to join CPTPP. Um, I think there's a discussions about wanting to join groupings like APEC. Um, we UK would like to become an ASEAN dialogue partner. So and and sort of behind that comes the the commercial businesses would would also support those initiatives. I believe. And Tsuroko Sensei, uh, to, 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 to ask again, uh, from, from, from the Japanese perspective, you have these um, uh, dueling uh, bids coming into CPTPP. Um, Japan has taken up sort of the trade uh, leadership in, in, in American absence um, in the region. Um, how is Japan thinking about sort of the contours of, of the economic uh, relationships uh, uh, in the Indo-Pacific? Uh, you, you have. To make it clear, you have the UK seeking to join the CPTPP, you have China, you also have Taiwan. Um, uh, how are Japanese policymakers thinking about this? Yeah, very much, uh, we, we very much welcome the UK is joining CPTPP. So as soon as possible, yes, uh, we, we very much welcome. China is a little bit trickier, I assume. Yeah, very much so. The Chinese and the Taiwanese applications, that will make uh, things a bit complicated for a fast track hope of Britain's uh, entry to the CPTPP. And also, the, what we are still very much concerned about is the lack of clear trade policy strategy from the Biden administration. So they, we very much welcome, we would hope to see Americans in the group as well, but uh, at, at the same time, we know that uh, it's really difficult for, for Americans to, to change their mind again. Yeah. I've, I've heard a bit from some, some Japanese uh, officials recently, the, the idea that the UK's uh, bid for the CPTPP could be a way to set a, a very high bar in terms of standards, um, perhaps one that would be uh, too high for the Chinese even to, uh, uh, to cross. Um, I, wonder, I wonder how you see that. And, 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 and I mean, it's, it's a very difficult, I imagine, uh, uh, position to be in. There is still, of course, a lot of uh, the Japanese business community and, and, and not to mention the other members in, in the CPTPP um, who would love more access to the Chinese market. Um, how, how, yeah, how do you, what, what are the sort of strategic options as you see them? Yeah. The, the Britain's application for T CPTPP is very political actually, political and strategic, the, because the, the trade benefit is going to be really small because the UK has already have a EPA, the Economic Partnership Agreement with Japan and, uh, and also secured the FTA with Australia and soon to be perhaps with New Zealand as well, but, but New Zealand is tiny part. But uh, so, so the, the UK has already building a good sort of a, a list of EPA and F FTAs. So the CPTPP, it's really symbolic. So it's, it's part of global Britain, so the, yeah, so, but, for Japan, because of this strategic significance and the symbolism, we, we support this. Do you think there's much uh, uh, interest in, in the EU, on the EU side in, in CPTPP as a, as a structure, Professor Nikkei? Uh, I think so, um, the question we are Focusing on, I mean, there are so many formats, so this is, uh, but CPTPP was interesting in one way, uh, compared with uh, received uh, other trade arrangement around, more or less around China, but not only that was agreed upon uh, formally, uh, is indeed the extremely strict rules uh, that would mean that if China were accepted, it would have been, it, it means that China would have completely changed in terms of reciprocity, uh, trade, and uh, control by the state, and so on, which it's exactly the same objective that the EU is trying to obtain from China, to, to, to fit with rules commonly um, 
uh, accepted by uh, liberal and democratic uh, economies. But I do not see, even if China joins with a lot of promise, like they did for the um, w, um, WTO, uh, the problem is always verification, and then if it doesn't work, coming back uh, to, you know, Nobody yet has decided to exclude China from any format because they did not respect uh, the rules they had agreed upon before. So I think it's, uh, it can be extremely dangerous, but I, I do not see that happening very soon. I don't think so. Sasha, can I ask you as well, uh, uh, obviously Russia isn't, uh, uh, isn't going to be clamoring to join the, the, the CPTPP any time, but, uh, but I wonder how, from, from Russia's perspective, this sort of emerging trade architecture in, in, in Asia, in the Indo-Pacific looks, and, and, uh, uh, and to what extent Russia does have interests, and if it does, uh, 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 how it plans to, um, uh, to express them. Russia is unfortunately very illiterate about the emerging trade blocks in uh, Asia Pacific. The discussion is dominated by the security agencies, uh, for that matter. Uh, our former chairman of the lower chamber of parliament, who is now uh, chairing the intelligence service, have, has written an op-ed where he deemed the original TPP as another blend of American uh, colonialism and capitalism trying to encroach and colonize Asian countries. It's a, it's a terrible, illiterate outlook that somehow dominates the significant parts of the bureaucracy that are in charge of foreign policy strategy. Uh, I see that many top bureaucrats on the economy and finance front are now seeing uh, increased challenges for Russia. So if Russia is to move into a decarbonized, uh, greener future with everybody, because it has no other choice. If, if China and you and everybody else goes green, then you have to adapt. And then uh, selling hydrogen, uh, like turning your natural gas into hydrogen is one option. It's the most kind of possible option for Russia to follow. But then there is still a discussion, OK, but uh, how about diversification? How about competition in other markets like ag and like anything else that goes beyond just natural resources? And then we enter into this discussion. And then, for example, Chinese membership in uh, CCTP uh, is a very important point here, because if China is there, a lot of rules for your engagement with your major non-EU trading partner will change. And here, I think that Russia is increasingly alerted to the risks uh, and will probably study the effects going forward 10, 15 years from now. It's also very interesting whether China has applied just to say, uh, we applied, but we haven't been admitted. You see, it's a kind of geopolitical plot to isolate China. or it's actually the same as with application to WTO. So there is certain amount of cheating that it's probably in design, but it's also a very important driver to do and deliver on structural reforms. The structural reforms that Deputy Prime Minister Lucha has put into 2013 blueprint for structural reforms. Not that much has been done since, but probably if joining this very progressive trade bloc is one driver that will alter a lot of practices within the Chinese economy, and that will affect Russia too. So Russia probably wants to learn more, but unfortunately, I believe that Russia will remain hostage to its very centralized and uh, economy where a lot of capture is happening through the very well-connected friends of President Putin. A lot of industries are monopolized either by the state or by monopolies that are private, in fact, but are monopolizing certain sector because of their connections to the Kremlin. And that will prevent Russia from being more progressive and open-minded to adopt this progressive standards. So we have, we have time for just one, uh, one more round on, on my part before we, we open things up to the audience here. But I do want to come back to, uh, 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 to where I interrupted you at the beginning, Joanna, uh, uh, to AUKUS and, and uh, to ask our, um, our esteemed uh, British and, and uh, uh, French uh, panelists uh, to give us a, 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 brief, um, a brief view of, of um, uh, 
on the British side, uh, the logic of the agreement and, and on the French side or perhaps the continental European side, um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, lack of, uh, the lack of logic of the agreement. Uh, shall I go first, or, or? Monsieur les Anglais, Terry les premier, as someone said a long time ago. <laughs> so. Please uh, uh, take it away. Um, uh, we can hear the, the, the positive case first. Um, so, for the UK, I think this this was discussed at the sidelines of the G7 summit as a, a sort of serious possibility. Boris Johnson. Again, as I've mentioned, very keen to demonstrate to his domestic audience that he is setting up bilateral, multilateral arrangements, and particularly with the US, AUKUS very much appealed for the UK. He, Boris Johnson has committed a huge budget to the Royal Navy, has cut back spending for the Army and the Air Force, so this announcement of military technology relating at the moment to nuclear submarines, but with future agreements on cyber sharing, AI and other things, quantum computing, is it, it, it absolutely meshes with his this integrated review and the global Britain stance that he is taking. Um, he, from his point of view, he believes that AUKUS crucially shows that the US is serious about countering China in the Indo-Pacific, um, that being Biden's, uh, the Biden administration's defining goal. Um, obviously, the UK is hoping that this might lead to a, a, a big deal with the Australia on submarines. Whether that happens or not is another thing. Uh, the UK is also hoping that Australia might offer a base to allow regular deployment of UK nuclear submarines, which would, we hope, they hope, be based in Perth. Um, and as Boris Johnson reminds us regularly, this would allow the UK to make a strategically consequential contribution to the security balance in Asia. I would say we are very much a junior partner and a very small part of this, and we will have to work very hard to maintain the potential um, economic advantages, industrial economic advantages that this could bring. Um, but of course, I can see from the French point of view that um, this looks suspiciously like an Anglosphere security alliance forming, and um, I should probably hand over at that point to Valérie. Is that, is that indeed how it looks to you? Well, um, yeah, to me, um, the problem with AUKUS is uh, many, there are many, many problems, and it raises a lot of questions. It opens some opportunities, but I think more questions than we don't see what will happen yet. Absolutely not. Um, if no, something like AUKUS was needed to reassure everyone that the US were really engaged in, uh, in the region against China, I think it's wor that is worrying. Because the US are there, they should be there. I mean, you do not, you do, you sh we shouldn't need all the time reassuring about what the US will do, and will, are they really engaged? And we must not forget, forget that AUKUS was also announced only a few weeks. I know that preparations were made before, but only a few weeks after uh, the US left Afghanistan, and maybe there was a good reason for that, good reasons for that, but the images were not very nice. And Biden immediately said that, well, we leave Afghanistan, but that's because we are really serious about uh, being there in the, in, in the Indo-Pacific. So this is one problem. As for France, uh, the, the, the negative result is that it's not a re negative result because uh, France will not completely reconsider its Indo-Pacific strategy or disengage from the Indo-Pacific. By the way, we have territories over there, so uh, contrary to the UK. And uh, so we have direct... <laughs> We have direct interest in the region, only in, ter in terms, for instance, of uh, uh, exclusive economic uh, zo uh, zone, the largest, the second largest in the world. So it's just that, to me, the AUKUS is not adding something like the EU or France. It is just retracting uh, something. So in that sense, it's not such a good 
Plessis. Allez, salut. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all. I, I'm going to uh, uh, resist the temptation to abuse my power as moderator and keep asking you questions and, and, and open it up to the floor um, to those of you here in the room and, and those of you online. Um, please feel free to send questions in via the chat box and we will, uh, we will read them out uh, to the panelists. Professor Jimbo. Uh, Ken Jimbo from Keio University. Um, I'm wondering that uh, how much those uh, value-driven aspects uh, will bring about uh, European uh, strategy in the global affairs. And um, Biden administration is hosting the Summit for Democracy uh, in December. Uh, but in the overall situation that democracy has been declining for past uh, 15 years or so, there are so many cases that you have, uh, you know, the abuse of the human rights. Even among those uh, democratic countries have been performing uh, not that well uh, in, in, in the democratic governance. So what, what is in Europeans' mind when, when you try to deal with those uh, Biden's uh, initiatives on democracy-based kind of coalition, like-minded states? And obviously, uh, European country has been taking a much tougher stance on China. And one of the elements that has driven by the Chinese kind of style of democratic, uh, you know, th their own governance has not really uh, coexist with uh, European values to engage uh, in China. But how, to what extent the Europeans believe that such kind of approach will create the kind of new alignments uh, among the like-minded states? And Valerie to Joanna, if I may. Why don't you start us off, uh, Valerie? Well, there is a de facto, I think, alliance on some basic principles of uh, democracy. Um, by the way, I have something to say about Russia. Uh, you just said that um, neither Russia nor uh, China are democratic countries. I would disagree on that. I don't think China is a democratic country at all. The system is absolutely not democratic. As for Russia, I know this position is not shared by many in Europe, particularly, or in the US, or even in Japan. Russia is an imperfect democracy. It can make progress, it can change, but you have election, even if these are manipulated. You still have, I mean, I had many friends in the end of the 80s in Russia. I very, very, you know, very, uh, uh, anti power at that time, they are still, they still have, we still communicate all the time on the internet or whatever. So I think Russia is not perfect, but I don't think, I think it's a mistake we make to equate Russia and China. Uh, Russia can pose some threat uh, to some countries, um, maybe overestimated, <laughs> I, I would say. Some, some countries like to be stuck in the past, and it's very difficult to say that openly, that maybe move on. Uh, is Russia exactly the Soviet Union? I don't think so. And this is a big difference with China, and I think we should speak, we should think about it. What the Europeans maybe do not like so much, some Europeans about the summit for, dem what's the name? Summit for democracies, is the US leads all thing. Uh, and especially because US did not give us such a good example of what democracy is under Trump, for instance. Plus, we have sometimes also problems with countries like Japan, where you have a lot of talk about shared values, but, uh, for instance, in terms of sanctions and human rights issues uh, with China, Xinjiang, and so on, it can be difficult. I mean, uh, position of women in Japan, it can also be difficult. So the concept of shared values that everybody is using, everyone is using, maybe you we should... You know, it's, it's useful, of course, but uh, it can be a, also a little bit complicated. Joanna, does, does, do, do, does things look different to you from, uh, from a UK perspective? Um, I would say that the, um, I mean, the Biden will host that summit of democracy, well, we're assuming of democracies in December 2021 this year, so, and that, one would expect will celebrate the great virtues of democratic systems. But I think that from the UK point of view, there's a recognition that good governance without democracy is possibly a safer standpoint strategically than 
is democracy without good governance. I think governance is a key aspect of the democratic approach, and this should not be forgotten. And, you know, we've all been in hibernation for almost two years, and um, we are sort of coming out, and governments are eager to sh shape the international sort of picture along the lines with which they're very much familiar in terms of democracy. But I think it's... It, um, I think this sort of maxim of building back better should bear in mind that governance is an essential part of that. Otherwise, you know, all our efforts will be rendered futile because there will be further deterioration of, of the international situation. And I think sort of coming out of the pandemic hibernation, there will be a, a, a requirement of huge diplomatic energy to, to encourage good governance around the world. Thank you. Do we have any questions from uh, from the online floor? Um, if there's if there's no one else immediately jumping up uh, here in the room, um, I will take take the opportunity to ask a bit of a follow up because I think there is um, a, a difference of opinion um, regarding how uh, how to to work human rights into uh, the relationship with China and and what role uh, how explicit sanctions should be, how explicit um, human rights should be in, in, in terms of, of the, uh, especially the economic relationships. Um, Japan, obviously, and, and the US have long-standing differences of opinion on, on uh, the use of sanctions. Um, I, I wanted to ask um, uh, uh, Sasha, since you're sitting uh, in Moscow, uh, uh, a Moscow that has been under sanctions, um, under Western sanctions of various kinds now for um, uh, seven going on eight years, um, how, how, I mean, to what extent do you see uh, the Western sort of objectives having been, uh, um, uh, been uh, uh, obtained um, with this tool? I mean, how, how effective uh, have sanctions and, and uh, 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 a, a human rights driven uh, agenda proven with respect to Russia? And, and is there a lesson to be learned perhaps about um, how to approach China? So first thing, uh, the Obama team has designed the sanctions the way that it wouldn't be overly disruptive to the global economy. So no nuclear options like embargo on Russian oil flows to Europe and other really crucial elements that could undermine uh, Russia, but also undermine global markets or energy security of the European par uh, partners have been discussed. And uh, when incompetent Trump's uh, sanctions team came close to that, was sanctioning Rusal that disrupted the global supply chain and aluminium market, and then OFAC had to work back with Rusal in order to bring them back to the market and then uh, do a sanctions regime that would kind of satisfy certain criteria. So I don't think that anybody wants to go back to this. Uh, and if you carefully read the Treasury's uh, report on sanctions efficiency policy over the last decade, you see a lot of uh, introspection and very good points on the limits of using sanctions. So I think that it's very much applies to the Chinese case as well. If we are trying to measure Russia's progress, some can make argument that, oh, Russia has not conquered uh, the whole of Ukraine because of the sanctions. Uh, I would question that. I don't think that it was ever a goal. Uh, but this argument can be made. If we look at the human rights record, uh, 2014 seems to be a democratic paradise compared to Russia currently. And I think that we are in downward uh, spiral. And in terms of economic resilience, I think that Russia is much more resilient to outside pressure than it was in 2014. Russia is paying its debt massively, both corporate and state debt. It's much less reliant on US dollar. It's obviously very reliant on euros. But I think that uh, the level of pain that Russia is ready to absorb is higher than it used to be in 2014. And it's not that different uh, than in many other cases. Anyone else from the floor here? Questions, questions? If not, let me uh, continue to uh, uh, abuse my moderator privileges um, and ask, ask you, following up on, on, on this discussion of, of the place of values in, in this agenda, Tsuroko-sensei, th there seems to be, I mean, 
talking to Japanese diplomats, uh, when they talk about the free and open Indo-Pacific, um, there seems to be a growing recognition that in fact what to the extent the Japanese strategy works, it works because it isn't drawing clear ideological battle lines. That, that what makes Japan, uh, Japan's outreach in Southeast Asia effective, for example, uh, is that uh, uh, Japan isn't, uh, 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 isn't drawing lines in terms of, of democracy and authoritarianism. Because, of course, uh, in, in Southeast Asia, that would exclude a, a great number of, of countries that, that Japan sees as crucial partners. Do you, do you worry at all about um, uh, as American involvement sort of uh, 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 ramps up, that, that America is making the competition overly ideological, overly sort of uh, uh, um, defined in terms of um, democracy versus authoritarianism? Yeah, great question. The, the, we, yes, the Japanese in its foreign policy doesn't quite uh, emphasize human rights issues. And uh, we, we don't say that uh, we ignore such things, but we are just, we say that uh, we are just pragmatic, uh, given the very diverse nature of this region. So looking around this region, there aren't many democracies. So Japan, Australia, New Zealand, of course, and, uh, and South Korea, perhaps. But uh, beyond that, so we have been saying that uh, the ASEAN is a strategic partner for Japan. But out of 10 countries, how many democracies are there? That's a huge question. So, but the reality is that as long as we are here, we need to deal with those countries. So the, that's why the, we, we, we need to be pragmatic. But at the same time, the, in terms of talking to Europeans and Americans, we, we always say that we share values. Then what that means, that, that's a huge question. So the, but the good news is that slowly, that the Japanese discourse is changing. So there are more politicians who, who, who talk uh, human rights issues in public, and compared to five years ago, 10 years ago, there are more, much, much higher interest here. So, so I think the sort of a seeds of change, I think we can find. Wonderful, one more, uh, one more call for questions from the, uh, from the online floor. Um, you guys are making me work hard here as moderator. Uh, anyone? Okay. Well, let me let me add one more um, uh, final sort of topic because we are coming up to the end of time. Um, but I would uh, I would be curious to hear uh, uh, as we come out of the pandemic. I mean, hopefully soon enough. Um, uh, what what you see uh, what what you see as 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 the sort of path forward um, on on COVID in, in in each of your home countries? I mean, I think we sometimes are sitting here in in Tokyo in a bit of a bubble. People tend to um, uh, tend to be frustrated with the management of uh, the handling of COVID nineteen, the handling of the pandemic. Um, uh, but uh, uh, the situation, of course, in in global context, looks looks quite different. So, uh, how how are things in the UK? How are things in Moscow? How were things in Paris when you uh, uh, when you left um, uh, and 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 what's uh, uh, what's the vision for um, uh, uh, for the end uh, uh, the end game if there is one um, maybe we can work uh, backwards from from our original order so let's uh, let's start with Moscow and 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 work our way to the UK okay you're, you're getting it easy because everybody else will benchmark against the worst case uh, Russia is in uh, like 40 plus thousand numbers of daily uh, infections and uh, with over 1,000 deaths uh, every day. Uh, vaccination rate is around 30% and is not going up because of huge anti-vaxxer movement, inconsistency of government messaging. Uh, Sputnik is most likely a reliable vaccine, but there is also distrust to domestically manufactured vaccines. Uh, the government is reintroducing some lockdowns, but they are not efficiently working as, for example, in Moscow, where I uh, happen to sit, uh, a lot of restaurants are working kind of in a speakeasy mode. So we feel the prohibition uh, wipe in a way. Uh, unfortunately, it's very likely to continue that way. Uh, the popularity of the regime, the availability of repressive tools is still there, uh, not to turn COVID into a big political uh, problem problem for the regime. And uh, final point, some very cynical senior officials I talked to say, 
Well, there are some side effects, Sasha, that are positive. Look at our pension budget going forward, like in five years, we're going to be in a much better place in that regard. That's super cynical, but that's also super Russian. Well, on that um, on that very Russian note, um, let's uh, uh, let's 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 end the Russian section on that very Russian note um, briefly because we are over time. Um, uh, what's the situation like in in Paris and in, in in the EU? Uh, uh, is it is it any better? If you look at the eastern part of or western part in France, it's not so bad for the time being. Just one word, I mean. This is where you see the difference between China and Russia. In China, zero COVID and a very autocratic way of dealing with the epidemics, which means that China is closed more and more, you know, completely closing to its outside. It's more, much more, you know, softer or soft <laughs> in Russia, Absolutely. apparently. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, and how about London? I mean, the UK vaccination rates look good from a distance. How does life in, in the UK feel for those of us who, who haven't been able to get there recently? Um, we have pretty high rates of infection, eight, over 80,000 new cases a day. Uh, but they don't seem to be too serious. As you say, a high rate of vaccination. I've got many friends who are catching it, who've been double vaccinated, who have what feels like a bad cold. Um, and we are progressing through a third vaccination campaign of boosters. Um, and Boris Johnson has taken a pretty laissez-faire approach to it. Um, I think the public is feeling liberated. And uh, if you go to London, it's, you know, central London on a Saturday night is rammed with young people having fun. So um, life feels pretty much back to normal. Well, on that uh, uh, on that note, I should say I'm I'm very glad to be here in in Tokyo and to have spent the last uh, uh, the last year and a half, the last strange year and a half here in in Japan, um, despite um, uh, uh, the Japanese public's uh, frustrations with uh, uh, with the handling of the pandemic. I think it has been a a, a relatively speaking a, 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 a wonderful place to be. Um, uh, thank you all for for joining us. Um, uh, thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you, Valeri. Thank you, Michi. And uh, thank you all in the audience. Uh, um, and we will we will close here.